Are you somebody with endometriosis who struggles with anxiety, spotting before your period, poor sleep or low energy, you are not imagining it. These are common symptoms of low progesterone and it's incredibly common in people with endometriosis. In today's video, I'm briefly breaking down the science behind low progesterone and endometriosis, how to spot the signs, and seven powerful ways to support your progesterone levels naturally. Before we jump into today's video, please give this video a like, share it with a friend, and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. So why does progesterone matter in endometriosis? Healthy progesterone levels are more important than you may think. Not only does progesterone support restful sleep, reduce anxiety, and improve stress resilience, but it's extremely anti-inflammatory and anti-growth promoting. So what's the relevance of this in somebody with endometriosis? First, progesterone blocks estrogen-driven cell proliferation. As you may know, endo is estrogen dependent. There are many abnormal occurrences at the level of the endometriosis lesions that promote their growth. One of these things is increased conversion of estrogen from testosterone via an enzyme called aromatase. Progesterone downregulates estrogen receptors and limits this already excessive conversion. Second, progesterone blocks MMPs, which stands for matrix metalloproteinases. These are proteins that help endolesions invade surrounding tissue. Progesterone blocks these MMPs, reducing lesion invasiveness and implantation. Next, progesterone, in a sense, turns off various pro-inflammatory chemicals, including tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and other inflammatory chemicals that commonly elevate in people with endometriosis. Fourth, progesterone shifts the immune response towards tolerance. We have two branches of the immune system, Th1, which is the pro-inflammatory, and Th2, which is the anti-inflammatory branch. Progesterone helps push the immune response towards that Th2 anti-inflammatory branch, which is exceptionally important in endometriosis warriors who have an immune cause for infertility fertility or recurring losses. Speaking of fertility, progesterone is also highly protective of the breast and uterine tissue. In the case of the endometrium, progesterone prompts maturation of the endometrium, which is often affected in people with endometriosis. Unfortunately, all of these wonderful benefits are affected in people with endo due to the progesterone resistance that is common in the endometriosis population. Epigenetic changes in people with endo alter DNA patterns in endometriosis lesions that silence progesterone receptor beta genes, contributing to progesterone resistance at the epigenetic level. Furthermore, the inflammation in endo that progesterone can reduce disrupts hormone signaling, preventing adequate progesterone production. The estrogen excess seen in endometriosis patients is also part of what suppresses progesterone receptors in endometriosis patients, fueling further inflammation and dampening the positive effects of progesterone. And lastly, chronic inflammation can impair ovulation and without consistent ovulation, we simply cannot make adequate progesterone. So what are some signs and symptoms to look out for of low progesterone? Common signs of low progesterone and endometriosis include spotting three days before the start of your period, a short luteal phase under 10 days. So this is the phase from just after ovulation to the start of your period. Symptoms like anxiety, mood shifts, or depression, especially in the luteal phase. So again, that phase after ovulation before the start of the period. Low basal body temperatures or weak temperature rise after ovulation. You wanna see a rise of 0.5 to 1 degree Fahrenheit or 0.3 to 0.5 Celsius post ovulation to determine if progesterone levels are strong and healthy. Difficulty falling or staying asleep, breast tenderness, headaches or migraines before your period, bloating and fluid retention, low libido and a history with miscarriages or difficulty conceiving can all be signs or symptoms of low progesterone. Just a quick tip here, track your cycle symptoms and basal body temperature. If you're seeing low temperatures or any of these symptoms, you could have low progesterone. If you have access to blood work and you wanna take it one step further, seven day post ovulation, you wanna see your progesterone over 18.5 nanograms per mil or over 58 nanomoles per liter. Now that you understand why progesterone is important, what happens in the body to produce progesterone resistance with endometriosis and what signs and symptoms to look out for, let's talk about some actionable tips to help you boost your levels. So tip number one, support ovulation in any way you can. 
Progesterone is only made after ovulation. No ovulation, no progesterone. Now I'm not just gonna tell you to reduce stress or make sure you're eating enough. Let's talk about some actionable strategies here. So first thing, identify if there is anything in your life you can delegate to somebody else or take off your plate. It's unrealistic to live stress-free, but we can make small shifts to reduce that load. If you're in a season of stress, this is going to act as a barrier to producing healthy levels of progesterone, but you can still make moves to support ovulation. In this case, I would recommend tacking on some adaptogenic herbs to build your stress tolerance, things like ashwagandha or potassium rich electrolytes to give your adrenals a little oomph. Next little tip here is whatever you do, don't skip on food. At the very least, pair a protein and a fiber every three hours, like a beef stick and a fruit, a banana with peanut butter, or a pre-made smoothie drink with a fruit. If you can do one better, tack on protein, fat and fiber, and space those meals three and a half to four hours apart. If you are simultaneously living with PCOS, four to eight grams of ovocetol daily is a helpful science-backed tool for balancing blood sugars, supporting your adrenals, and strengthening ovulation. My last tip for supporting ovulation is to ensure you're getting enough ovulation-supporting vitamins and minerals. These include, but aren't limited to, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, especially B6, and omega-3s. You can get zinc in oysters, chuck roast, pumpkin seeds, chickpeas and cashews. You can get vitamin D in wild caught salmon, sardines with bones, egg yolks, cod liver oil, and UV exposed mushrooms. You can get magnesium in spinach, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, avocados, and black beans. And you can find B6 in chickpeas, chicken breast, tuna, bananas, and potatoes with skins. And lastly, you can find omega-3s in your oily fish like tuna, salmon, mackerel, sardines, and anchovies. So my next tip for boosting progesterone levels is to exercise. 150 minutes of light to moderate movement per week can be really helpful for supporting HDL cholesterol. Exercise is the best way to boost HDL cholesterol and your body uses HDL to make progesterone. If you have a demanding job, make an effort to prioritize movement on the weekends or get a walking pad to exercise on while you work. Take a walking lunch or do some gentle stretches in between meetings. All right, tip number three is to eat enough healthy fats. Cholesterol is the building block of all steroid hormones, including progesterone. Include egg yolks, avocados, olive oil, nuts and seeds, nut butters, olives, and coconut in your daily diet. Tip number four is to have some important labs tested. Prolactin is a hormone that is produced with suckling at the breast. Unless you're somebody who just had a baby and is breastfeeding, it wouldn't be normal for your prolactin to be elevated. Yet it's a commonly elevated hormone in women with endometriosis. High prolactin acts as a pro-inflammatory chemical in people with endo. It also works to reduce progesterone by suppressing FSH and LH and blocking or weakening ovulation. You can speak with your doctor about medications like bromocryptine or cabergoline if your levels are very high or consider 300 to 1000 milligrams of Vitex daily to help with boosting dopamine and lowering prolactin. Also, consider having your thyroid labs tested. Hypothyroidism is a common cause of suboptimal progesterone. Your TSH should fall below two milli IU per liter. And checking your reverse T3 can indicate if your thyroid is sluggish due to stress. Reverse T3 is an inactive form of free T3 active thyroid hormone and a notorious cause for an elevated reverse T3 over 27 nanograms per deciliter is stress. A complete panel, including free T3 and free T4, should also be included in this investigation. Tip number five is do what you can to reduce estrogen dominance. As we've learned, high estrogen activity at the level of the endometriosis lesions is part of what's contributing to progesterone resistance in people with endo. Here are my top tips for supporting estrogen elimination, but keep in mind if you have a unique root cause for high estrogen not addressed here, you may need to dig a little bit deeper. So tip number one is to keep your bowels moving. 
This is the third step in estrogen elimination. If you're not having a routine satisfying bowel movement every day, consider some helpful supports like partially hydrolyzed gorgum or magnesium citrate to get things moving. Tip number two on the estrogen front is to have one daily cruciferous vegetable serving. This includes veggies like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, and radishes, and bonus points if you can buy or sprout your own broccoli sprouts. Adding a handful of these doesn't just promote estrogen elimination, but the sulforaphane content also helps reduce inflammation at the level of the liver. Cruciferous veggies contain indole-3-carbonyl and DIM, which help push estrogen to the less estrogenic preferred pathway of estrogen elimination. Tip number three on the estrogen elimination front is to make sure you're getting enough B vitamins, magnesium, and choline. Most people with endometriosis, due to the effects of chronic inflammation on the nervous system, need more of these vitamins. I commonly recommend a B-complex or a prenatal multi with enough active form B vitamins. I really like the Needed brand, Seeking Health, or Full Well Fertility, which you can see pictured here on the screen. Your liver relies on these nutrients to support phase two estrogen elimination. Tip number four on the estrogen elimination front, it's a big one, but it's balancing your blood sugars. When insulin is high, it can cause chronic elevations in estrogen or estrogen dominance. Since both are growth promoting, this is not an ideal scenario to be in when you tack on progesterone resistance. I have three tips to help you achieve healthy balanced blood sugars. The first is to pair protein, fat, and fiber with every meal. This is the perfect combination of macronutrients to help slow the release of sugar into the bloodstream from your food. Here's a little visual of what foods fit under these categories. Tip number two for balancing blood sugars is to take magnesium glycinate. This mineral is a science-backed mineral for helping to make you more insulin sensitive. And my third tip is to exercise, but especially after meals to help with the blood sugar response from your meal. A 10 minute walk after meals can do wonders. Okay, and a little bonus tip here for supporting healthy estrogen levels is to avoid endocrine disrupting chemicals. My tip here is to just very slowly, not all at once, because it can certainly get really expensive, but really slowly between now and the next few years, start swapping out chemical laden cleaning and beauty products. The endocrine disrupting chemicals in these products can bind to estrogen receptors or block adequate estrogen and or progesterone receptors, messing with your hormonal profile. Okay, now we're back to our bigger tips. We're on to tip number six for supporting healthy progesterone levels. And tip number six is to sleep well. Aim for eight to 10 hours of sleep a night based on your unique needs and level of inflammation. Poor sleep increases cortisol, and cortisol is a thief that steals resources away from progesterone production. If you're struggling to sleep, here are a few of my top tips. One, try sustained release melatonin, somewhere between two and 10 milligrams. It's a well-studied supplement for endo pain reduction too, so you hit two birds with one stone. Tip number two, take a warm Epsom salt bath. The heat from the water pulls heat from your core to the surface of your skin, helping to cool your core and to promote more restful sleep. Tip number three, and this is one I know you've heard a hundred times before, but it's to avoid blue light one to two hours before bed. I know this is a tricky one, we all have FOMO, but blue light increases cortisol and high cortisol is not conducive to good sleep. Okay, and tip number four, try this ashwagandha stress relief tea that you can see pictured on the screen. It's available on Amazon. If this is inaccessible to you, three to 600 milligrams of an ashwagandha supplement, 100 to 200 milligrams of L-theanine, or 100 to 300 milligrams of phosphatidylserine or GABA can be helpful for promoting restful sleep. Okay, now we're on to tip number seven. If all else fails, tack on some progesterone support in your luteal phase. This is not the same thing as synthetic progestin pills like those found in Visan. This is bioidentical progesterone support that works with your cycle. This product on the screen is a clean topical progesterone cream that should be applied three days post ovulation for 10 days. You cannot use this if you are not cycling or taking other forms of hormone therapy. Rub it into the wrists, back of the knees, and inside of the elbows in a rotating fashion. So one day at the wrists, next day inside of the elbows, and then the third day back of the knees and rotate. Stop applying the cream 13 days after ovulation 
or if your period comes before the 10 days of application are up. It is very important you do not apply the cream throughout the cycle only in the luteal phase as it can affect ovulation and disrupt your hormonal profile. Supporting your progesterone doesn't just help fertility, anxiety, and sleep quality. It can improve endometriosis pain and positively support immune dysfunction with endo. Okay, that brings us to the end of our video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like, share it with a friend, and hit that subscribe button. I would like to know which of these tips are you going to try first or which ones are you already doing in the comments below and I will see you in the next video.